Homes Awry is a coalition of organizations working to ensure that everyone has a safe, healthy, and affordable home. Hopefully, these interviews will bring insights to the need and work and highlight where housing intersects with other issues and opportunities. Um, I'm Karen Alzate. I'm a state representative for the city of Pawtucket. What does home mean to you? Like when you hear the word home, like what sort of images come up? <sighs> That's a really good question. Um, home for me means, um, I think of I think of warmth. And I think it's a, like an all sense of the word. So, you know, coming home and it means just like my own, my own warmth, like people I love are, are here and, um, you know, out of either, you know, in the winter time, I appreciate it so much more, um, you know, having heat because it is really cold. Um, being able to be myself in a space, um, you know, because once I leave my home, I, there's a lot of different hats I have to wear. And so when I come home, I can just take it all off and just be my real authentic, you know, as much as I can be myself. So just that to me, like that's what warmth feels like to me. Is there uh, a piece of legislation that uh, you've seen um, during your um, tenure that you thought was like really impactful towards increasing affordability? So um, I don't, since I've been in there, um, one of the biggest issues that I think has been is that the my particular chamber, we haven't really attacked housing issues the way that we should. And I think that, you know, I've only been there for two years, I'm going into my third year. And so I'm really hopeful that this year we will be aggressively attacking um, housing ab affordability and ability, right? Um, it seems like it's something that's always been put kind of like, it's really important, but we have all these other things that are also more important. And, you know, one of the one of the good things about COVID is that it really showed us that housing is the most important. And so, um, you know, this year we're putting up on, you know, up for a vote, um, the $65 million bonds. We were able to pass that through our state budget in December. And so that's a huge step in the right direction, um, but we can't stop there. You know, people do put in legislation that has to uh, do with housing, but it's never super impactful. Um, you know, when we talk about housing, we need to talk about money. And usually a lot of people don't like to do that. Yeah, totally. Um, is there a certain approach that you think uh, the state should take in terms of uh, affordability? Are you, like, do you think um, it's more about production or more about rental assistance or um, like, is there like a specific angle that you think would have the biggest impact? So I don't, I don't think that there's one thing, right? We, it's not, it's not something where we can, you know, throw, <coughs> excuse me. It's not something that we can throw money at, right? So we have this bond, which is amazing, but there's so much more that needs to go, that needs to happen. Um, we have a lot of in old laws again, you know, against renters and even landlords. So we need to address that. Uh, you know, there's not enough, uh, you know, $15 minimum wage is something that we are also fighting because we know that right now with our minimum wage is $11.50, that's not enough to get you the cheapest apartment, right? And so, um, so I don't think that there's just one thing. I think there's many things. And so that's why I think that I genuinely believe that this is under this new leadership in our chamber, we're going to really tackle gen like real housing issues and it's full circle, not just parts of it, because I don't think that, you know, raising the minimum wage and leaving everything else out is going to solve the problem. It's not. Uh, or putting this bond in, it's not going to solve anything. Like there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, kind of speaking about the like $15 minimum wage. Um, that's really been like a long 
movement that's kind of been coming for like I remember seeing people with the fight for 15 shirts on like I don't know six or seven years ago like really when there was started to become some traction there um and like in terms of like you interacting with your constituents around that issue uh what like how does that interaction happen like um is there like do you like how does the community talk to you about like the need for increases of minimum wage or um other issues like how do you like what's your process for interacting with the community so i think that it's i try to have genuine conversations right um you know i'm totally on board for 15 dollars minimum wage but I think that some of the best conversations I've had is that we both, you know, myself and constituents and community, we agree that $15 minimum wage is not going to get us to where we need to be, right? Um, we have to talk about when we specifically talk about minimum wage in that sense, we have to talk about our small businesses and how is this going to impact them, right? Because one thing is I've had conversations with some of my small businesses where they are, they want to pay, you know, a living wage, right? They need, they need the employees, they need the help, and they're willing to do that. But they're afraid that they're going to have to cut down on their hours. So it kind of doesn't really scale up, right? So that's an issue that we're facing. And so what I appreciate, appreciate about my community is that we're able to have those real conversations. And I think that that's something that we haven't had in a very long time. So, um, you know, I come with, I come with questions as well. And, you know, they, they answer some of mine and, um, you know, I think always having, you know, both sides of the story is what's been helpful for me. You know, I do want to give people a living wage. Um, so what does that mean? And how does, what does that look like for all types of businesses, right? Because we think we sit here and we say, of course, Walmart can pay $15 minimum wage. Absolutely. But what about like my favorite taco shop that, you know, is a small family run business, um, only has, you know, just their families running it, maybe one extra person, and they are not able to afford that, right? And so, um, it, it's it's a much bigger conversation and you know I appreciate that we can always have those conversations that are really big and you know uncomfortable sometimes so you 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 interact with your community and you like hear from both sides and then is there like a what's the process for like bringing those issues to the uh, to the legislature and sharing that is there um, is it really just you like bring a bill that you've written and then you like bring that to the ch uh, specific chamber that you're working in or um, like are you having a lot of outside conversations where you're trying to work through the problems? So a little bit of both right um, usually the idea of a bill comes through working and talking with outside people um, you know community organizations uh, even regular constituents who have concerns about a specific issue and then trying to work with them to draft something that uh, could potentially be something that we vote on and so uh, you know we draft it we do all of our research we put as much as information as we feel is necessary and that way we don't have to change up the legislation too much if it comes down to that. Um, and then making it easy to, to inform my colleagues, right? Why this important, why this issue is important because I think sometimes we forget that even though I'm from one part of the state, the whole state votes on this, right? So I have to, I, if, I'm, if I'm advocating for more affordable housing, right? Um, what does that mean for someone in Pawtucket? to what does that mean to somebody maybe in Barrington, mm -hmm. right? And so it's really just trying to get everybody's ideas onto one piece of paper, if you will, and being able to advocate for that, spe like that specific legislation. Um, and then, you know, we have our, our committee hearings and we're able to advocate even better on that. And then also building the relationships with other, with other uh, legislators. And then figuring out who on the opposite chamber and the Senate side um, is willing to do the same legislation and work together. Yeah, interesting. Um, is there one like accomplishment 
that you are like particularly proud of, um, like having worked through that process? Yeah. Um, so my first year, um, I was uh, I was top five in being able to work on the Reproductive Privacy Act. Um, so that allowed us to codify Roe v. Wade here in Rhode Island. Um, that process was really interesting because you know it seemed for I was a you know first year legislator. Um, I was still trying to get to know the building and figure out how things worked, and. I really saw exactly how how important this was such a big issue on uh, for everybody right whether you were against it or for it and it was so interesting to see how both sides really discussed the issue and how, you know how they were willing to um, work together because I think that that's the part that people don't necessarily see and both sides really did work together and so for me it was like it was a huge accomplishment because. If I was a first time legislator and I passed this really great bill and I was a part of that. Um, but it was disheartening because it took a really long time. So we submitted that legislation in January and we actually didn't pass it till June. So seeing all of, you know, it took six months to do something like this. Um, I mean, obviously more than six months because people have been working on this for years, but um, to really just narrow it down to something where both sides could really work together and get something done together that was that was probably the best part is really just seeing exactly how both sides discuss the issues yeah that's great it's mm -hmm. even more important nowadays after um, the federal yeah. changes Absolutely. um yeah awesome um so in housing like like in the affordable housing development, a lot of the decisions are made in the municipal level, like um, like even like allocation of property or like what gets through zoning and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, how much or like what, what sort of interactions do you have when sort of designing policy or um, allocating resources with, the, with your municipal partners? Um, to make sure that there's like an alignment between like what's happening at the state level and maybe like what's happening in Pawtucket or, um, or other sort of municipal um, governments. So it's really just for what I have done is I've introduced housing legislation and I have brought it up to my, my, um, my city leaders as well, um, letting them know that this is where, you know, I stand on certain issues and Pawtucket has, been really interesting because at the state level it sounds or at least it seems like our delegation is not um, on the same we don't necessarily agree with our city council um, on this particular issue and so what I want to do and I've been trying to do is really educate um, our city council as to why these things are important and you know they might not pass it on the city level, but we might pass it on the state level and, you know, it's going to trickle down to us. And so we really need to um, educate. I think that there's a lot of um, misunderstandings around affordable housing. I think that there is a lot of taboo as to what that means, especially in, uh, in Pawtucket, we have uh, two housing projects. And so, you know, when you use those kinds of words, um, you think of uh, a group of people and, you know, that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to uh, be able to make sure that everybody who lives in Pawtucket is housed and has adequate housing. And so I think it's, for me, it's just been about building those relationships and really educating them on what it is that I'm doing at the state level and them educating me as to what they are doing on the um, on the city level so that maybe we can come to a compromise because um, you know it just it doesn't it doesn't seem like it makes any sense for the you know the state delegation to be on a very different page than our city delegation um, so just a lot of you know because I think that at the state level, I get more information as to what other communities are doing, what other legislators want to do. And so I'm all about sharing that with my city colleagues because I want us to be able to support one another. Because again, I think in order for us to make significant change 
in our housing um, ability, we need to work together. And if we are not on the same page, it's not gonna it's not gonna look good, or it's just not gonna work well. Yeah, definitely. Um, if you like, were to um, like, is there like a like if you were to speak kind of to your constituents about sort of um, poverty and housing, is there a, like a call to action that you would like to make? Like, is there um, like if they were to like show up to something or like do a specific thing, is there is there something you would ask of your um, constituents or even Rhode Island in general? Um, since it, like it, like you're saying, you you are in some way, even though you represent. Pawtucket and that area, um, the legislation that you passed does um, apply to the whole state. Yeah, I um, one of the biggest things that I really want to work on in <clears throat> myself with other other legislators is my my biggest call to action on any issue is going to be to make sure that you reach out to your municipal leaders as well as your state leaders. I think that, you know, that's something that I've learned from um, community organizers. They're really good about making sure that they, you know, whatever issues that they're passionate about, they let us know. They let us know that they are our constituents and they want us to work on this or do this or come to that. And I don't see a lot of that being um, transpired on our city levels. And so, you know, it just makes it easier if we share, if myself and my councilman, we share the same constituent, you know, that it comes to the both of us, not just one of us, right? Because, you know, they're also voting for us and our, you know, we we deserve, no, they deserve to get their, their answers, question, their questions answered. And, you know, we owe it to them. They're, they are the voters and, you know, our constituents are our most important people that we need to make sure that we keep them in the loop, that they keep us in the loop. But also it just provides like, you know, community engagement, right? Allowing them to feel like they are a part of the, of the community that they serve. Um, so I, that's my biggest call to action is to like, let us all know what you're all thinking and not just the state level, but our city level, because they also make decisions that impact all of us. It's not just the state thing. It, you know, it's, our city is just as important as our state. Is there anything that you would like that you think we didn't touch on that you, you think is really important? Is there something that you're championing that you wanna see happen in this, um, in this next session? That, yeah. 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 Um, so I put in a housing legislation, um, and this is what makes me really passionate is, um, I put in housing le le legislation for evictions. And so um, I was made aware that if a landlord um, is evicting a tenant, the tenant's name goes into like this portal. And that kind of puts like an X on the tenant's back. and. You know, and it goes into the portal the moment that the eviction gets filed. So even if the tenant comes out um, and the judge, you know, rules in their in their favor, their name is still in this portal. And so that makes me really concerned because you know we hear so many scary stories about um, you know slumlords who are just like kicking people left and kicking people out left and right. And so what the legislation will do is it'll. Um, stop that from happening. So if you are a landlord and you file an eviction against your tenant, the tenant's name does not go into the portal until a judge rules in the favor of the landlord. So now when you know a tenant is leaving and they're going to look for another apartment, you know their name is not gonna appear in that portal unless the judgment was against them you know, the, or the judge rules in the, the landlord's favor. So that's, that's just one small step to get us um, into a better housing, um, like, system. Yeah, for sure. Um, like, uh, on the subject of evictions, the CDC moratorium is coming up at the end of, um, at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hopefully the federal government will um, extend that again or, um, yeah. uh, but like how, 
I think that, that it brings up sort of an interesting topic, which is sort of like the way that we're kind of talking about the municipal being nested within the state and then the state nested in the federal. Um, and so when these sort of federal protections lapse, um, like how, how do you and your colleagues sort of like, like anticipate those things and like react to them? Um, because I think a lot of people in the housing world are like, we see this problem that's sort of like on the horizon, which is the, yep. that, that it's going to lapse. Um, but we uh, don't see a lot of action being taken either from the governor or from um, the legislature to sort mm -hmm. of react to that. And I don't know, like if you all are in conversation with the, your federal colleagues and they're like assuring you that it's gonna get taken care of, or like how, how does that um, play out? Yeah, so I think that that's actually a really great point because that conversation is coming up um, or the conversation has been coming up, um, figuring out, you know, we're, obviously we're hoping that the federal, um, our federal delegation will continue to advocate to extend it. But also, I know that there's other legislators who have been talking about and putting in legislation that will extend it here in Rhode Island. Because the reality is, if the federal government doesn't do it, we're still left with people being evicted. We're still, you know, and, you know, there's going to be a, a much higher number of people being homeless just because, you know, some people are not doing what's right. So um, it's, it's a conversation that we're all having. We know it's looming. Um, ideally, I hope that next week when we go back into, into the um, General Assembly, that we are able to, to come up with something that is going to be able to help us in case um, you know, the federal level doesn't, doesn't extend it. I think that's all the questions. Um, yeah, is there anything else that you want to cover or touch on? Or? No, just, you know, continue to like, keep us on our toes, really. Yeah.